We all know that technology has changed in, in both our home and our offices. And, uh, and what I want to challenge today is whether our thinking has changed at the same rate. So the first slide, which you've already seen a preview, unfortunately, is a house in Paratai Drive. I went for a walk with my wife last Sunday and, and I took a photograph of a whole lot of houses in Paratai Drive, so New Zealand's most expensive street. So here's a $5 million house in Paratai Drive. So just imagine what the technology, how the technology has changed in architecture. So before, 25 years ago, they had a drawing board, they had a uh, pencil, rulers, that's how, you, that's how you drew up a house. Now it's all done on, on uh, computers, uh, CAD, and so there's enormous technology change in, uh, in how we build houses. So architects, I mean, it's a creative industry, isn't it? Now let's take a look at the letterbox. There's a close-up of it. Now that's the same size letterbox as when I delivered the paper 50 years ago. They haven't changed it. They haven't thought, hey, maybe the architecture of the, of the letterbox needs, uh, needs changing. Maybe we get bigger newspapers today. But I'm not going to spend my time uh, talking about, uh, about architects. I'm going to start talking about new thinking. Now, first of all, we'll start off with old thinking. So old thinking is all about analysis. It's all about truth, logic, arguments. It's all about the past. And often we're locked into old patterns. We can only see what has been. We can only hear what we understand. We can only analyse what's happened. Now, new thinking, that's all about the future. It's all about perceptions, intuition, <coughs> new ideas, new possibilities, and vision. I'm going to start off with just a, a, a practical example, which was the New Zealand Entrepreneurial Summit, which happened a couple of years ago. And that had a fairly lofty vision. It was to take New Zealand from 0.1% of the world GDP to 0.2%. And we called for entrepreneurs. That was the entry fee. One idea that could take New Zealand forward, and you got a ticket. The theme was 100 entrepreneurs, 100 ideas. And we had ideas that came forward which could have changed this country, could make it seen as an innovative country, as a mecca for people to come to, new, uh, for people to, come to this country, set up businesses. I'm going to start off with my favourite example from it, which we imagined. Five guys in a bar in the, in the UK. And uh, one might be an architect, one might be an accountant, a lawyer, all earning over £100,000, over $220,000. Now, there are 600,000 of these people in the UK. In fact, 60,000 of them are civil servants. Another bar, another part of town, there might have been a tube driver, a mechanic, a plumber, all earning over £50,000, over $100,000. So you can imagine almost 2 million people all having, a, having some surplus income at the end of the year, probably all go on holidays. They all can do things, go to restaurants, etc. Can you imagine what would happen if they open up the, if they open up the Daily Mail one morning and there's a big full-page ad which says, come to New Zealand for free. Here's an economy airfare for free, come to New Zealand. With one little proviso, you have to buy a 10,000 special edition visa card and the money can only be spent in New Zealand. And our good friends at Kiwi Bank said, yes, that can be done. So you get it, they can come to New Zealand for free and they get back one $10,000 visa card. If they want to upgrade to business class, they can pay the difference. Now, at the moment, we don't encourage that $10,000 person. We encourage backpackers. In fact, the average expenditure by the 1.5 million tourists that come here is $2,783 per person. Two-thirds of those are from backpackers who spend about $1,000 in New Zealand. We have 250,000 tourists who come from the UK, 200,000 from China, 200,000 from the USA. Can you imagine if we took on another 1.5 million tourists who also were going to bring in, spend $10,000 before when they bought their tickets. Can you imagine the international media attention? CNN, BBC, what would happen? We'd have people, to, uh, people queuing outside travel offices. They'd want, all want to come to New Zealand. Everybody has heard Americans say, 
God damn it, I want to come to your country. I really want to come to your country. If they can come for free, they will come. They will come here. You might remember uh, a couple of years ago, Hamilton Island, they, they wanted to hire a groundsman. They said, listen, we'll pay $100,000. They say they got $50 million worth of media attention. Can you imagine the international students when, you, when your father and mother are sitting there in China or Hong Kong saying, where should we send our little Johnny? Probably wouldn't be called Johnny. Uh, but <laughs> shall we send to Australia or UK? Where should we send them for a year of education? Well, to send them to New Zealand for a free trip to New Zealand, of course they'd come here. So we'd change the way, change our education in terms of international students coming here, which is an enormous export earner. But if we live in the past, we can't analyse those sort of unknown variables. We don't know how many people are going to spend more than $10,000, how many people are going to spend less than $10,000 and put the money in the government coffers. We can't even conceive of the international uh, publicity on it, the impact of that. We can't conceive of that. It's worth probably more money than tourism has ever spent in this, uh, in, uh, ever. I think we can do better than that. You know, we gave women the vote. We invented the jet boat. We started the bungee industry. We did all sorts of new things. The Entrepreneurial Summit came up with $100 billion worth of things that we could do that would take this economy forward. Like Jeff said, we're going to make a few mistakes. We'd make, we'd make some mistakes on the, old, uh, on the way. But, you know, the great thing about being a small country, and it's like being a small company, is that if you, is it means nothing to the world if we go from 0.1 to 0.2% of the world economy. But it would transform this country. Transform this country, and we can transform it by some new thinking. I want to talk another one. So I've got some favourite subjects here. So, so next one I'll talk about, in 2001, I took my family to the UK. All my friends at universities were having these sabbaticals, and I thought, well, man, it's a good idea for we guys in business to have a sabbatical. So I took my family to the UK, and while I was there, I read this Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And here they take 28 OECD countries, and they measure them in terms of business startups. New Zealand was number one in terms of startups, number one out of 28. And where were they in terms of those startups lasting five years? Number 28. Right at both poles. Got blamed on business education. Now, it so happened about that time, the principal of Only Hunger High School, Chris Saunders, was in the UK on a Wolf Fisher scholarship. And he stayed in our flat. And, uh, and so we had a, uh, a few drinks. And after the second bottle, uh, I said to him, Chris, we need to do something about this. We need to have a business, we need to have a business school at Only Hunger. We want it right on your campus. And he, yeah, 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 you come up with a proposal. So anyway, he probably thought he'd never hear from me again. But next June, I brought a proposal to the Only Hunger board, and I said, let's set up a business school on this campus. And Chris got right behind it. We appointed a very, very good head of the, head of the business school, Manish Daji, and... And we really had some, uh, had some ideas. I mean, I knew nothing about education. But that's good. It's like Jeff said, when you, when you start a business, it doesn't matter if you know nothing. It's, the, uh, it's having the right foundation. And so the ministry were against the concept uh, at the time. I mean, they were saying we, business does not belong in a, in a secondary school curriculum. But fortunately, and it's really good that Pam's here is one of the organisers of this whole conference, because... We got money out of, out of different uh, ministry, out of the trade, uh, trade and Enterprise, who are one of the sponsors here today. So they gave us 400000 to get this set up. So this what really was new thinking. I mean, I think that all the other projects that they funded, they, go by, they get professional fund people who know how to put an application and fill in uh, 50 sheets to get their funding. None of them worked like this business school. It was just like setting up a business, you know? We made, a, we made a lot of mistakes along the way, but we saw students as customers. We wanted something that was meaningful to them, that was active, that was fun. We know they like playing on, uh, on video machines, and so we had business games on video machines. We brought speakers in 
a lot of young speakers, brought Sam Morgan and Teresa Gatting, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, speakers from the Entrepreneurs' Organisation. Just to open up their eyes, that's what we were trying to do. For every two students, we gave them a local business. Might have been the local Baker's Delight or the local swimming pool. And every Friday, they would go and visit them. So on Monday, if we were doing learning about pricing, uh, they'd go through the theory of pricing. On Wednesday, they'd get in their groups, get in uh, various groups, uh, about 10 of them, and, and they'd be thinking about their company. They'd be developing 50 questions from the textbook on pricing. And then on the Friday, out they'd go and they'd go to their individual businesses, talking to the owner or the marketing manager, whoever it was. Now, they'd come back very, very excited because suddenly they'd find that, you know, you put a cross on a bun at Easter time and suddenly you can up your margin by 100%. I mean, they learned what happens in the real world, but also meant they could answer questions. They weren't just answering questions to answer an exam. They were answering questions they knew the answer to. They knew what it really meant. This, I found out, was called experiential learning. Now, I didn't know that word. I probably couldn't spell it at the time, but, uh, but this is a, is a way of learning that kids want. It uh, brings a classroom to life uh, in the real world. Now, the ministry, to their credit, I mean, they did a total U-turn. And now, as, uh, as David said, uh, business is in the national curriculum, and the ministry are going at the, the fastest rate to get more and more schools on, bringing uh, uh, teaching, teaching business. In fact, I just, you know, I do want to say that, that both sides, both national and labour, were very, very keen on this, on having business in the national curriculum. I had a meeting with, uh, with Trevor Mallard, and he had the head of the Ministry of Education and the head of New Zealand Qualifications Authority. And we sat in the same room and, and he said to them, now listen, is there any reason why business cannot be in the national curriculum? This was in 2006. And they said, no, no, no problem at all, sir. And so, uh, so he left and they set up a, a, a group, a working group, which only hung of people were on the working group and going full steam ahead. And... Uh, and then Trevor Mallard got put into another portfolio and everything stopped. And it really reminded me of something that you've probably seen in a TV series. Whoops, sorry, that's experiential learning. <laughs> you've probably seen that. So yes, Minister, really works. But with the result of knowing all about, uh, all about the, um, this experiential learning, we decided to set up a, uh, a building construction school. And again, we were taking students who didn't want to be at school or only at school to, to play rugby. And, uh, and under NCEA, they could spend 50% of their time on the building site. Now, we got some help from, uh, some good help from Fletcher's. Um, again, we didn't know a lot of things, like you have to get resource consents before you do this sort of stuff. But anyway, we were building huts, uh, huts t totally self-contained huts, which get sold off at the end of the year to... Um, uh, uh, to our backpackers in, in Northland. So every year we get the funding that we, we get the funding for the next year by selling off these huts. Next year we're building a house, in fact, uh, through Habitat. And so, I mean, we really see kids who, uh, yeah, I said, just don't want to be at school. Suddenly they can walk proud. When they go to prize giving, um, they really, you know, th they walk up on the stage and they never would have got up on stage uh, at any time before but suddenly there's something that they can do, it's practical, and they do things around the school to fix up, fix up things. I was at a uh, Pacifica forum um, about three years ago, and, uh, and if anyone's been, been to a Pacifica forum, they're often, they're not, uh, they're not as quiet as you, and, and suddenly a woman stood up from the back and said, hey, listen, I want to say something. So I had to stop in the middle of my speech, and she said, I just want to say, my son, he was in a gang over the Christmas holidays, I didn't see him for eight weeks. I know he was in a gang. I didn't know where he was, but I did not hear from him. I didn't see him. And then he got into the building construction school at Only Hunger, and he has been the perfect child. Every Sunday, we drive up Pleasant Street where the school is, and he says, look, Mum, that's what we've done on the hut. He's now got an apprenticeship, and I am just so thankful to that building construction school. And I think that's, um, you know, and I think the... Uh, you know, there have been attempts to try and do this. The great thing about this, about doing things at school, there's still some discipline in, in there. By the time they leave school, the discipline's gone, and if they do, and it's the reason why kids go into apprenticeships and then move out pretty quickly.
because they're not, they're, suddenly they're, they're free. They've got no, got no discipline. This works, and that's experiential learning. It's good to see that, you know, AUT have got the Venture Fund, University of Auckland Business School have got Spark, encouraging students to do things while they're still at, uh, while they're still at university. Because probably all of you, you've, you've been through school, university, and, you know, say four years at university, then you're expected to go out and do something. Well, have you really, have you, can you really remember what happened when you were learning commercial law or accounting, whatever it was, at stage one? Probably not. But, you're, you know, so you're not really that, uh, that qualified. Probably Germany is a very, very good example where 60% of the students at the age of 15 actually go into trade school. They don't go to university. So they go into a trade school and they get sponsored by a company. It might be BMW or a small engineering company. They get sponsored, get paid a small amount, and it increases each year over the five or six years that they're studying. And they're proud. And I think if anyone's you know, seen some of those factories, uh, you know, those um, people working on the floor, they're wearing ties, and uh, I probably wouldn't get a job there. Um, but they're, you know, they're, they're wearing ties, and they're very, very proud of the job that they're doing. Here we want to train everyone, we want everyone to be, uh, you know, to be fantastic, what they call intelligence, but not necessarily intelligence, uh, intelligent for the real world. So I know just got a few minutes, I just want to tell you about my, my latest crusade. I mean, I love this, you know, uh, what Jeff was saying, David and, and Goliath, and I think we took on the education department and, you know, got through there. So I've taken on a crusade against obesity, because I was really disgusted last June, every year, the OECD bring out these statistics. New Zealand had gone from, had gone to number three with a third fattest nation in the world after USA and Mexico. And we'd jumped from number six over about three or four years. So we're not, we are the third fattest country in the world. And what got reported on July 1? Uh, uh, Coke who got the happy ambassador coming to New Zealand. I mean, man, you know, there was not nothing in the paper about the fact that we're bloody fat. So, I mean, the harsh reality is that this generation, that the, the next generation will live uh, less than, than this generation. And that's never happened before. It's always, we've always lived longer. Now we're going to be living less. You know, and that's, we're drinking these fizzy drinks. And we're eating, eating these fast foods. There's no, you know, lack of exercise. We're all couch potatoes. So, um, but you know, there are a few facts about this, and I know I, I just read again in last Sunday's paper, some of you might have read it, the editor of Healthy Guide said, the findings suggest, but it's not proven, that obesity is, is, is a result of eating sugar and fats. Well, man, I mean, how far do you have to go to prove these things? <laughs> you know, sugar's a demon. You know, soft drinks are probably the most damaging substance known to man. You know, here it is just sugar and a lot of sugar. You know, you wouldn't have 12, uh, 12 teaspoons of sugar in your tea, most of you, yet you're prepared to drink it in your Coke. You know, sugar and water, and, and then if, if it's not just going to, going to kill you because of the sugar, they give you a whole lot of phosphoric acid in it so that it rots your teeth on the way. <laughs> or there's fruit flavouring. You know, again, and I know a lot of people, that's, that's probably not as well known. They, get, they think they're doing, doing something uh, good for their kids by giving them that... Uh, those fruit powders and then filling them up with water. It's just sugar and water. There's no fibre, no protein, no fat. It's just a straight dose of sugar that goes straight to your liver and will give you premature death. <laughs> I mean, it's... I don't want anyone having sugar in their coffee now. <laughs> I mean, it's a poison and it's addictive. It's addictive. That's what... You know, in, in 20 years' time, you'll say, and people are saying, oh, Tony, you're so stupid. Um, they'll be saying it'll be just like cigarette smoking. It, with a, we have to reduce the consumption of sugar. It's doubled in the last 50 years, and we have to get it back. We should be eating the sugars, and, you know, they've got fibre in them, and in, in fruits, etc. But need some new thinking. Now, just finish off. As a, um, you know, as a three-year-old... If I, had this, if I had this pen, which I've got in my pocket, that could be the sky tower. It could be a sword. It could be a train. It could be anything that I wanted it to be. So we were born new thinkers. You know, but what happens? What happens is we start school. And school is all about facts. It's all about and analyzes problems, problem solving. It's all old thinking. We, 
what we do, we go out, get up to, up to school and then we've learned all new thinking, then we unlearn new thinking for, for the next, 20, uh, next 15 years. We're born new thinkers and so we have to get back to new thinking. And that's all about perceptions, intuition, new ideas, new possibilities and a new vision. Thank you.